Our scripture lesson today is from chapter 5 of Romans, verses 12 through 21. Romans was written by the Apostle Paul, a very educated man. He didn't have the same English teacher I had. He has run on sentences. He starts with something and then by the end is like, wait, what did he just say? Romans is riddled with that. Makes it very interesting to read. The words will be on the screen, but let's pray before I begin. Father God, Lord, I hold this manuscript in my hand. Lord, I pray that these words that I share will bring you honor, glory, and praise. But Father, if anything in here or anything about me gets in the way, I pray that you'll just sweep it all aside and speak directly to the heart with your perfect spirit. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all, because all have sinned. For sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam, who is a pattern of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one man's trans trespass, much more, more surely have the grace of God and the gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so through the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. But law came in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that, just as sin reigned in death, so grace might also reign through justification, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I knew I'd need a drink after that. So this morning is our second week in our study, of, in our series where we're getting back to basics. As our guide through this series, we're using this study. This is the absolute basics of the Christian faith. This is the study guide we used in confirmation class last year. We've used it in a couple of adult classes. There's companion videos that go with it. And our topic today is what about evil? What about that? Both of our scriptures today are very important in getting our mind around this topic as we embrace this question. Genesis 3 tells us the story of how evil came into the world. And chapter 5 of Romans makes it personal. I want us to hear verse 12 again. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin, and so death spread to all, because all have sinned. This is personal. This is everybody's story. This is your story. This is my story. From the oldest to the youngest. Yes, even those children that came in here this morning. From the oldest to the youngest. This is our story. As we look at this, we're going to focus on three questions. Right out of this book. Why is there evil? Who is Jesus Christ? 
And why did the Son of God become human? As I mentioned, there's videos that go along with this book. There's actually 16 videos that go along with each of the 16 questions that are very important. In Christian circles, we use words like catechesis and catechism. Fundamentals, the basics of what we believe in the form of questions. And we learn the answer to those questions so that we can articulate so we can explain to others what we believe. So what big words did we use? Catechesis, catechism, articulate. Here's how it breaks down. There's 16 questions in this book that describe the fundamentals of what we believe as followers of Christ. And we learn the answer to those questions so we can tell other people about it. As we get back to basics, I want us to keep it simple. Common, everyday language so we all can get our minds around it, and we can share and discuss with each other. We're not going to be able to see all these videos here on Sunday mornings in the sanctuary, but uh, if any one of the Sunday school classes is interested, we have them available anytime. We've got the books available. Just let me know. This morning, I want to share a short video that tackles the question, why is there evil? The absolute basics of the Christian faith. Why is there evil? So as we said before, in the beginning, God was living as a trinity, whole, complete, and perfect. But God decided to create as a gift. He whispered galaxies, and there were galaxies. He whispered pandas, and there were pandas. And he created us too. And it was all awesome. But God wanted something more from humans than he wanted from pandas or star clusters. He wanted real relationship. He wanted to have the kind of relationship he had in the trinity with us. So, as Genesis 127 says, he created humans in his image. Now, the idea of being in God's image has a few different dimensions we need to understand. First, being in God's image means that we resemble God. This means that when God creates humans, he invests them in characteristics that he himself possesses. Now, as Romans 120 teaches, all creation reflects aspects of God's nature. But humans resemble God in special ways. We are given the ability to know God, and in order to know something, we must have some connection to it. Ostriches and wild donkeys and mountain goats do not know God, but the Bible teaches that God knows and watches over them. But the relationship is fairly one-sided. Humans are different, though. We're known by God, but we can know Him as well. And true knowledge of perfect God naturally leads to joyful worship. There's another way that humans, created in the image of God, resemble our Creator. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God says, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. When God refers to himself, he speaks of himself as an us. God is not just a single I, but is in fact a trinity of persons, a unity that includes difference. When God creates humans, he makes them in his images, male and female, a unity that includes difference. Humans resemble God by being different yet unified, like the different notes in a chord that combine to make a harmony. But there's more. Humans not only resemble God, but we're created to represent him in the world. We're meant to be God's representatives in the way that United States congressmen represent their home districts in Washington, D.C. As I said in the last chapter, the work of being God's image in the world brings with it some responsibilities. So. Just like a congresswoman has work that she has to do as part of her official duties, humans were given a task as God's official representatives. As Genesis 1 teaches, humans were meant to rule over creation. It makes sense then that God placed humans in a garden and gave them some specific responsibilities. He gave them some things to do and some things not to do. He told the humans to tend the garden and he told the humans not to eat the forbidden fruit. He gave them a choice. What do we do? We did the terrible thing. We broke God's command and continue to do so today. Now some of you might be thinking, why did God give humans a chance to mess up? Why did God make it possible for humans to go wrong? Well, here's why. It's because real relationship requires real freedom. Imagine you're a young man or woman. You started thinking about marriage and there's a guy or girl that you think is the bee's knees. You're crazy about them. They're just right. They look like you wanted to look. They act just the way you wanted to act. They're perfect but they won't give you the time of day, not interested at all. 
And now imagine there's a pill, it's called the Cupid Capsule, and you could give this guy or girl the Cupid Capsule and they would instantly fall in love with you and remain in love with you forever. Would you give them the pill? Most people would say, no, definitely not. But why is that? Because most of us understand that real love requires real freedom. If we make someone love us, the very act of compelling them to love negates the very thing we want, the free response of affection. And this is why God gave us the ability to obey or not. The problem for us now is we didn't obey. And as the Bible teaches, the real consequence of disobeying God is disrupted relationship and death. Adam and Eve's disobedience messed up their relationship with the triune God. Connection and communication were broken, like when phone lines or cell phone towers are destroyed and communications disrupted. Humans no longer had the full knowledge of God they were supposed to. Disobedience also destroyed humans' ability to represent God and carry out our responsibilities. We could no longer rule over creation as we were intended to. Instead of unity with God and others, humans are now at odds with each other and God. Instead of enjoying the closeness of family, humans became enemies of God and each other. And death also entered the human story. So now our default setting, when we come out of the box, is already aimed toward death. Cut off from God, the redeeming source of all life, we die. Now when Jesus comes, he's going to solve both these problems by restoring our relationship with God and by conquering death. In a word, Jesus is going to restore the image of God that we had in the beginning. Brian, I appreciate you adjusting the volume there. He made it better, but there's nothing we can do to make that guy finish his sentences or pronounce it, enunciate his words. So. so why is there evil? Really simple. God gave us free will to obey, and we did not. Adam and Eve, they ate that forbidden fruit. Evil came into the world. Did this surprise God? Of course not. Since God knew what was going to happen, does that take away the consequences of a free will choice to disobey God? Of course not. We're given free will to choose, and that is a big and awesome responsibility. And with every choice comes a consequence. I know that's not very popular anymore. Our world today is doing a lot of work trying to take away the consequences for our choices. This is not new. It's just brazen. It's bold. And it is shameless. Evil has become very confident and bold in our world and in a very short period of time. In our society, we've gone from calling, going to calling bad good and good bad. More and more, we embrace evil things making it mainstream and marginalize what is good and what is holy. So before I go any farther, I want to pause for a moment. And I want us to talk about what a theologian is. We need to come to agreement on what it means to be a theologian. So a theologian is someone who studies the Bible, maybe other texts, to get to grow in our understanding of who God is, grow in our understanding of what religious beliefs are. We might actually watch videos or movies. How many folks in here have ever read your Bible? Anyone ever see The Chosen? Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, you are all theologians. We are in this together. The story in Genesis 3, it gives us insight into the origins of evil in the world. It gives us insight to our human condition. Some theologians want to tell us that this is metaphoric, that this is symbolic. Other theologians want to tell us that Adam and Eve are true people, historic people. What do you say? This story in Genesis is not some optional story that we can explain away, choose what we're going to do with it. It's a biblical story, and it explains our human condition. 
what is our human condition? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what are the wages of sin? Death. Sin brought death into the world. There's evil in the world because God gave us free will. Free will to choose. To choose to obey God or not. That's the truth of it. That's the beginning, that's the end of it. Now, we might want to try to blame all the problems on the world, in the world, rather, on the last generation. After all, we inherited this mess from them, right? Wouldn't we be giving up our hope along with that? Now, we might want to try to blame all the problems on the world in the next generation. All they do is look at their phones and mess with their phones. They don't even know how to write cursive. That'd be transferring our responsibility for our own choices on them, wouldn't it? We are in this together. That's always been true. The rebellion in the Garden of Eden, described in Genesis 3, describes broken relationships. Broken relationships between people and creation, between people and people, between people and God. In the, in the creation, the serpent is cursed. The ground is cursed. It says Adam's going to work by the sweat of his brow. Eve is going to suffer pain in childbirth. I wonder what these things looked like before that. The relationship between people and people. Adam tried to blame Eve. Transference. He tries to put it off on her. She did participate in his temptation. And the scripture does describe conflict in the relationship. It says, he will rule after you. You will chase after your husband. Anyone ever notice in the world difficulties in relationships? Trying to get along with others? What was the sin of Adam? He did nothing. He said nothing. He stood there and watched. And the relationship between people and God. Outright disobedience. Why? Because they want to be Lord of their own life. They didn't want to submit to God. And Adam tries to blame God and Eve in the same sentence. That woman that you put here, she gave it to me, and I ate. He made his choice, and choices have consequences. Choices have consequences. I don't care what the world tells you. Every choice you make has got a consequence. Nobody can make that go away. And we've all been making bad choices ever since. I'm going to say that one more time. We have all been making bad choices ever since. All have sinned. All are guilty of sin. And we are all in this together. This is our story. We're guilty of sin, and the wages of sin is death. God's remedy for sin is Jesus, the Christ. Takes us to our next question. Who is Jesus Christ? He is the eternally begotten Son of God. He is the Son of Mary. Fully God, fully human. Before there was a universe, before there was this world, before there were people, before there was life, God was. I hope all of you theologians just noticed my bad theology. God created time, and God was his bad theology. Before all of that, God is, and God is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinity, whole, complete, and perfect. And out of love, this perfect God created the universe, created life, created all things. And people are a very special part of this creation created in the image of God, given real freedom, given real responsibility, 
so that there could be real relationship. And did we respond in gratitude? No. Thanklessly, we chose to disobey. We owe everything to God. We get everything from God. Life, breath, the universe, everything. And instead of responding in gratitude, what did we do? The very thing he said not to do. And now that's part of our human condition. You know, there's that old joke, don't think of a zebra. Don't do this thing. And they couldn't quit thinking about it. Until they finally caved in and made this mess. And because of our disobedience, we're in this together. We lost so many things. Those broken relationships between people and God, people and people, people and creation. But God's got a plan. The Old Testament reveals that plan in action. What's his plan? He creates a people through a promise of Abraham, promise the covenant God made with Abraham. What did he say? Through you, all the world will be blessed. And four or five hundred years later, he makes the same covenant with the Israelites. I will be your God. You will be my people. And through you, all the world will be blessed. That's what the Old Testament is all about. It tells this story of God's plan. Until the fullness of time, the perfect time, Christ is born, comes into the world. Now, we could spend a whole hour on that. Why is that the perfect time? I'm going to take a running over anyway. I'll go for it. You know, there's an old story about this raging fire in this warehouse. And the big city fire department is trying to put the fire out. They have to call from the little rural town to send your volunteer fire department over here. We need help. This little old fire truck comes roaring into town, roars right into the middle of the fire, right in the middle of the warehouse. And they jump out and they frantically start putting this fire out all around them until the fire is put out. The mayor of the town wants to give them a big medal and goes to the fire chief and he says, listen, I am so impressed at the bravery of your people for just running right and rushing right into the center of that fire. He shakes his head and he says, oh, fire chief, he says, you know, it's not so much about bravery. He said, I told all these firemen that I'll put brakes on this truck when I'm good and ready. He says, I'm good and ready. <laughs> God sent Jesus when he was good and ready at the fullness of time. And so, Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, came down all the way from heaven to earth to where we are to provide a permanent and perfect connection between people and God. Son of God, Son of Man. Jesus is permanently linked to humanity. One person, two natures, fully God, fully human. He is both. He has a human mother and a divine father. Human body, divine power. Human will and human emotions and a divine will. Same emotions. He's both God and human. This is extremely important. If he wasn't fully human, he couldn't come all the way to where we are. And if he wasn't fully God, he couldn't take us all the way to where God is. And so, we approach that throne room, throne room of grace with boldness and thanksgiving. Jesus bridged the gap. There can be no clearer, no better revelation of God's love. God became man. So when we look at God, we look at the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see the Son, a human being, looking back at us at the right hand of God the Father. That's who Jesus Christ is. So why did the Son of God become human? All of us theologians, we can really complicate this. 
because God loves us. Because he wants to make us true children of God. We broke the connection, but God, he put it back together. We were ungrateful. We were given the gift of life and a relationship with God. We rejected him. We messed it up, and out of love, God put it back together. Through the people of Israel, through the covenant with Abraham, through the person of Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man. But we still get that question, right? Why? Why did God do this? Such a big old mess. Sin is so perfect in our lives that we need somebody to tell us. We excel at it. We get good at it. We pat ourselves on the back in the midst of our mess. So here we are. Why? Why did God bother? Why didn't he just wipe it all out and start over? It's a very, very important question. Sounds foolish. It sounds silly. It's an important question because God is perfect. Perfectly good and perfectly and completely an understanding of what's going on in this mess that we're in and what is wrong. And God hates it. God hates sin. This God of love hates sin. God would have been perfectly justified and letting us experience the punishment, the consequences for our choices. And the wages of sin is death. God could have just let it go, but he didn't. And so we ask why. We're stuck with that question, why? In our humanness, all of us theologians, we tend to complicate these things. The answer is extremely simple. God loves the world that he made. God loves you. The creator of the universe is radically in love with you. He's not willing to give us up, not willing to write us off, not without putting up a God-sized fight to save us. Several years ago, Lorraine and I were in Uganda outside of Camp Hala. I forgot the name of the camp where we stayed, but we met Ingrid Wiltz. She told a story. She had been working in ministry in in Uganda in the streets of Kampala for years and years. She was dealing with orphans, homeless people, but she was always protecting the children. People were dying of AIDS, drugs, all sorts of hepatitis. It was terrible. It was a mess. And greedy people took what they wanted for themselves and didn't care about anyone else. She kept crying out to God, said, God, can't you see what's going on here? These children are starving. People are dying. God, can't you see what's going on here? God, why don't you do something? Now, she was not some kind of a heretic. She knew God. She knew God well. She told a story of one time when she had these children. She was protecting them, and these gunmen came to take them, and they would take them off into slavery. Sex trade starts somewhere. While these men are running in with their guns and yelling at them, she cries out to God, in the name of Jesus, be gone. And she watched these men fly through the air and land out of the way so she and the children could sneak off. And the whole time she's crying out to God, God, why don't you do something? Can't you see what's going on here? And over and over she got this response from God. She didn't hear voices. She got the in her heart the response from God. He says, my love is greater than than all sin. My love is greater than all sin. The rescue operation that God carries out through his son Jesus is not just some momentary whim on God's part. This was the plan. This incarnation of Christ is reveals something very deep in God. And what that is, is that God loves us. God loves you. Love goes so deep in God that the scripture tells us that God is love. God loves us so much. God loves you so much that his ultimate goal is to make us family 
to make us children of God. That's what God wanted from the beginning. God's plan from the beginning. God wants us with him. He wants us to participate in life as God's family. Jesus became human so that we could be his brothers and sisters. God is our Father. John chapter 1, verse 12. To all who believe in him, I'm going to say that again. John chapter 1, verse 12. To all who believe him and accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. Created in the image of God, rebellious in nature, lost in our own sin, consequence of our own choices. To all who believe in him and accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.